Thank you for joining us for this week's message at Crosswind Church. If you have any questions about this message or about Crosswind Church, please visit us at www.crosswindchurch.net or you can email us at info at crosswindchurch.net. Well, good morning. My name is Jeremy, and I am the pastor here. I am so thankful that you've joined us for worship this morning. It's a brand new year, right? 2018, hard for me to kind of uh, believe that. I do want to like show ideas as we get started. How many of you all made New Year's resolutions this year? Hands up. <laughs> all right, how many have already broken them? Okay, that's me. Right? I, I, uh, I thought like I would be healthier and exercise, and I'm seven days into the new year, and um, I ate so much last night, I, I got sick. So um, anyway, it's just not, it's not going well for me. But if you're here today, let me tell you a little bit about how things work. At Crossman Church, Crossman Church, we talk in uh, terms of series. Uh, what that means is we pick a topic that that Bible addresses, and then we talk about that topic for four or five weeks, and then we get done talking about that topic, and then we pick another topic, and we talk about that um, and, and kind of address that. So, if you're here today, it's the very first time you have picked an awesome Sunday to show up because today you're starting a brand new series called "Get This Brand New." And, uh, and it's kind of fitting that in the new year we would do that because some of you all have brand new plans for a brand new you in the brand new year. And uh, so you're listening to a sermon series called Brand New. It just, it just kind of all uh, kind of fits together. Um, if you were here last week, we had um, an awesome time. And, and let me kind of tell you, if you weren't here, what you missed. So we, we took all of these chairs out and we put in tables and we ate breakfast. Your elders here at Crossman cooked breakfast and their wives cooked breakfast. And... Um, and we ate together, and we got to share what God has done in 2017 and kind of look ahead to what uh, we're praying he'll do in 2018. And in the process of that series, or that, that little talk last week, I got to talk to you a little bit about um, about uh, how Crosswind was formed and founded and kind of where we came from. And uh, just in case you missed, I want to kind of to kind of share with you uh, a, a little bit about this. Uh, somewhere, it depends on who you talk to, between 15 years ago, somewhere in that ballpark, plus or minus a couple of years, a group of five families um, started looking around at Northwest Tennessee, Obion County, Union City area, and, and there were some things that they noticed. They noticed that there were people that were far from God, that the conventional methods of reaching them were no longer working. Um, they recognized that uh, there were some folks that had been a part of church and, and in a thriving relationship with God that had pushed back from that uh, for one reason or another, and uh, we'll talk about some of those reasons here in just a little bit. And, and there was kind of a spark that was going to fade into a flame in these five families that said, we want to do something different. We want to, to create a different type of church. And, uh, and it was that vision in those families years ago that's led to where we are today. In fact, if you're sitting here today, you're a part of um, the church that came from uh, that vision. And, and if you look around a little bit, it's kind of interesting to see. Uh, you would recognize, especially if you're like me, I had the privilege of growing up in church. Our church and churches and church, as we think about it, has changed a lot in, in say, my lifetime, right? It's changed a lot in the last few decades. And, and, and so I, I grew up <clears throat> going to church. I'm so thankful that I did. But, but the church that I grew up in was a little different. It looked different than, than Crosswind. It looked differently, I guess, if I use my grammar correct. So we had these huge walls in, in our sanctuary. Um, and at the top of the wall were stained glass windows. And they kind of went all the way around. They let in lots of natural light. And um, some thought they were real pretty. And, and maybe they were. What I did as a kid is I counted them. Uh, particularly while the preacher was preaching, I counted, I counted those and I counted the lights in the, the ceiling. That was what I did. If you're counting lights right now, okay, it's fine. But anyway, so uh, that, was, that was kind of what I did growing up. We had this, and, and we, in our sanctuary, we had uh, pews. We didn't have chairs like this. We had pews, uh, which if you don't know what a pew is, uh, count yourself lucky. Like it was a bench. Um, that was made out of wood, and, and if, if you were upscale, both the back and the bottom were, were padded. Um, but I, I've been a part of some churches uh, where like, you just get one of them padded, or they're both like the hard wood, and you have to sit and listen. Uh, pastors tend to, to speak uh, maybe a lot longer then, and, and what they would do when they come up on stage is they would stand behind uh, a big box, a big wooden pulpit that they would stand behind, kind of separated them from you. So if you look around right now, you go, well, we don't have pews. 
Um, we have chairs. Uh, you can see it's easy for us to kind of move out and in and use this room for more than just an hour on Sunday. And, and, and we don't have, uh, you know, a big box on stage. So if, if Jeremy's zipper is actually down, I can't hide it, right? You just have, it's just, by the way, it is one of my biggest fears is to get up and preach with that. I get, if I'm it's terrified by it. Anyway, uh, so, so like, it's never happened, but, but uh, anyway, it's one of my biggest fears. Anyway, <clears throat> you don't have that. You don't see any stained glass. They tend to be expensive, and we want to control the lighting and make sure that we kind of create the environment that we're shooting for, so there's not a lot of, that there's no outside light uh, in here uh, at all if we can help it. And so things just kind of, just kind of look Different, and, and, and you can kind of think, you know, one of the biggest changes that I, that I like is that I don't have to wear a suit. <laughs> and when you all show up at church, you don't have to wear a tie or a jacket. And ladies, you don't have to wear a dress or heels or closed toe shoes or pantyhose or whatever it is, all of those things, right? And, and, and so those things, uh, we don't, you know, there's a part of the church that I grew up, they weren't necessarily bad, they're just things that the church has changed, but, but what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks together is, is this simple fact, that, that even though the church has changed so much in, in a couple thousand years of its existence, and even though the church has changed so much, even over the last couple decades uh, of, of my life and your life, as we look at it, there are still and this is what we're going to talk to you about. Just a there are still some things that you are holding on to. There are still some things that we are holding on to that were never intended to be there in the first place. That Jesus never intended to be a part of the church. And here's, here's why this is such an important topic for us to discuss. Because there are some of you who are here today and you've wandered back into church for the very first time. And the reason you left in the first place is because there was something that the church was holding on to that you just couldn't get over. There was, something, there was something that the church was holding on to that you just kind of pushed back from or you resisted in some way or somebody let you down or somebody hurt your feelings or the building didn't go the way you wanted it to go and so you end up walking away. And here's the reason why I'm glad you're here or if you've never made a relationship with Jesus Christ or priority, this, this is why I'm glad you're here. It's because the things that you naturally resist about church and the things that caused crosswind to form over a decade ago, those things that you naturally resist about church those are things that the church should be actively resisting. The things that you resist about the church, I'm going to tell you just a little bit, are the things that the church should be willing to let go of. And so if you're here today and you're far from God, or you're here today and once had a relationship with God, but you've wandered away from that and pushed back to that because of the church, here's what I want you to do. Don't cut me off. I want you to pay attention while we talk for the next few minutes because I want you to give Jesus another chance. So I think what you're going to see is those things that you resist about the church are things that the church needs to let go. Uh, in addition to that, if you're here today and you're a believer, you're a follower of Christ, let me tell you why this is such a big deal for you, this series. And today what we're going to begin. The things that we say today are going to be frustrating maybe. They may upset you a little bit. Um, they, they may even make you angry, right? It's certainly going to be challenging. And, and that's, that's okay and that's good because I'm convinced that if you're willing to let go of some of these things that you're holding on to, You'll be able to go to another level in your relationship with God. You'll be able to go to the next step in your relationship with God. You'll be able to walk in and experience the freedom and the gospel of Jesus that has the power to transform your life. And so whether you're here today and you're far from God, or whether you're here today and you're walking with God your entire life, if we're able to understand this principle and apply it to our lives, it is paradigm shifting. And I'm excited about it. But before we get there, we have to kind of go through a little bit of history to kind of tell you about, about what it is that we're holding on to. So for today, um, I get to kind of nerd out a little bit and talk about church history, and, and hopefully you'll stick with me as we get our way uh, through uh, 2,000 years of church history in, in about five minutes, okay? So, but when Jesus, um, or before Jesus, excuse me, the way that the Jews interacted with God uh, was based on uh, an old covenant. A covenant is just an agreement with God about the way the relationship is going to go. And that covenant was based upon laws. In fact, it was based upon a lot of laws. It was based upon over 600 laws that determined and governed how the people of Israel would relate to their God, right? And their relationship with God was defined based on how well they adhered to those laws. But in addition to the 600 laws, they also had some other, what I call guardrail laws. These were laws that were put in place to keep them from breaking the law. So they weren't official laws given by God. They were just kind of safety net laws, if you will. So, for instance, if the law was, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, which was what the law was, then what the Jews would do is they would go, well, you got to put in some guardrails. What exactly does that mean? What does it look like? Well, it means I can't work 
on the Sabbath day. So that means I can't light a fire on the Sabbath day. That means there's only a number of steps that I can take on the Sabbath day before it becomes work. That means that I can't cook on the Sabbath day. None of these things were actually prescribed by the law. They just became oral traditions. So if you were a Jew, your relationship with God was based on 600 and some odd laws and all of these oral traditions that you had to keep, and that is what defined your relationship with God. Then Jesus shows up. And Jesus makes this audacious statement. It's not so audacious to us, but the Jews who have heard it in the first century, they would have been appalled at this. Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law. And, and all of the law and the prophets, Jesus would say, is going to hinge on one solitary command. Not 600 and some odd plus the oral tradition. Not, not the big ten, even the ten commandments, right? Not even those. But it's all going to hinge on this one law. You ready? Which is really two laws. This law of love. And Jesus would put it this way. When cornered by the Pharisees, he would say that all the law and the prophets are hung on two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you know what Jesus had the boldness to do? He took that neighbor, first love your neighbor as yourself, and he took it the next step, and he said, you need to love your enemy. What? What? All of the laws down to these two? And Jesus goes, yes, that is what I want you to do. And your ethic is going to be defined by your love of others and your love of God. And you know what's neat? For, for a few centuries after Jesus started the church, the gathering of believers, they got it. And you know what's interesting about that? Is that it's really hard to hate somebody that is trying their best to love you. It's really hard to be upset with somebody who's trying their best to love you, right? I mean, isn't it, isn't it hard to be angry at someone? And so for, for the first 300 years, guess what? We can go and we can read historical documents. I love that. But uh, that the Romans wrote down about the Christians that existed in the first 300 years or so of, 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 of Christianity. Do you want to know what they wrote? They wrote things like, listen, this group of Christians love each other so we don't get it. Not only do they love each other, they, they wrote down things like, hey, the Christians do a good job of taking care of orphans. Meaning that, that in the Roman law, if you had a child that you didn't want, like say you were hoping for a son and you had a daughter, you know, you could just put that girl out on the street as a, as a child or infant or as a baby, leave, their, leave her exposed to the elements. That was completely okay. If you had a child that had a birth defect or was sick in some way, then you could totally kick them out of your home and not have to take care of them because they'd be drained on your home. But do you know what the Christians did? The Christians took those kids in, even when they weren't there. The Christians took care of those kids, even when they were there. And, and, and first century, second century, third century Romans looked at that, and we don't get that. That just doesn't make sense. In addition to that, they wrote about how the Christians took care of the poor. <clears throat> they took care of those people that were needy among them, not just their relatives, and not just people that were other followers of Jesus Christ. They took care of the poor that weren't even there. They didn't even believe like them. But you want to know what, what, what the thing was that, that I love reading most in those ancient writings that the Romans did? The, the thing that, that characterized Christians was this. This blew the Romans away. They weren't afraid of death. In fact, when faced with, with torture or, or, or put to death in the Colosseum, the, the Christians, they weren't afraid of it. Didn't seem to bother them. As if they had something else to look forward to and the Romans could not wrap their head around it. In fact, <coughs> Christians were so liked and loved by others, even people that didn't agree with them, that, that for the first 300 years, the persecution that came to Christians was primarily for one thing, and that was this, their allegiance to Jesus. They were radically committed to Jesus. What that meant to the Romans was that they had another God other than Caesar. They, they had another king other than Caesar, and that's where their primary allegiance lies. And as a result, then, then what would happen is the Christians would be persecuted, not because of what they've done, but because of their allegiance to Jesus Christ. Yet something happens. Something, something kind of happens, and, 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 and something changed. At some point along the line, our relationship with God and Christianity can be defined by something other than this ethic of love that Jesus would give to us. And to understand what that is, I, I need to give you, a, 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 introduce you to a model. Okay, don't look on the screen. Let me, let me tell you about this model. This is a model of how church is done, how relationship with a deity is done. Okay, it's not necessarily a Christian model. It's not a Jewish model. It is ubiquitous throughout the world, this model. We didn't make it up. 
Uh, we, we can read about it in all kinds of books. We stole it from some other places. That's totally fine. We just want you to know that on the front end. We didn't sit around making stuff. We're not smart enough. But you know it to be true. This is what we're going to define for the rest of our time together, for the next four weeks or whatever, as the temple model. Okay? We'll reintroduce it again next week. But here's what the temple model is. We'll put it on the screen now. The temple model is based around a sacred place. This means that there's a place where God resides. To the Jews, generally, it was the temple. Specifically, it was the Holy of Holies. That's where the Spirit of God rested in this place in the temple. The Jews believed so much that God's presence was connected to this special, sacred place that when the Jews were in captivity in Babylon, they felt like God wasn't with them. They felt like God had abandoned them. And the only way that they could get back to God was to go back to the temple in Jerusalem. We can read the Psalms and we can read the prophets that talk about the way that the Israelites spoke about this when they were in captivity. It's a sacred place where God resides. In that sacred place where God resides, there are sacred texts. To the Jews, this was the law. To the Jews, this was the prophets. Right? To those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, this is the Holy Bible, the God's Word, right? There's a sacred text, and that sacred text is protected by a sacred man. That man that, that, that is, is a learned man, that man is educated, that man is the only one, certainly, that's capable of teaching us what exactly the Scriptures have to say. And so for us to, to kind of get close to God, for us to have an interaction with God, we've got to go to the sacred place where the sacred man teaches us about the sacred text. And that's where we fall in. We're the sincere followers or, or the followers that are, that are hearing about the sacred God by the sacred man in the sacred place who's interpreting the sacred text. And what happens in this system, is the sacred man becomes incredibly powerful because he stands at the gates to heaven and hell. And if someone in that position is corrupt, then they also can become incredibly wealthy. Yeah. This is not a Jewish thing. It's not a Christian thing. It's a people thing. This is the model that makes so much sense to us. It is so ingrained in who we are. Let, let, let me kind of explain how it's not a Jewish thing, not a Christian thing. Yesterday uh, was my anniversary, and uh, and so we uh, loaded up in the car to celebrate our anniversary. We got Taco Bell for lunch because that's what we do um, on our anniversary. And then we got in the car and we drove to Paducah, um, and we were going to go see uh, a movie and go to dinner. And we went to see um, the new Star Wars movie it's the second time. That I'd seen it. Okay, now, um, what I'm getting ready to tell you about Star Wars here is not a spoiler, okay? You're not going to ruin the movie for you. Um, but in the movie, there's something that's pretty pretty interesting that I want you to kind of recognize. Some of you that have seen the movie, you're already a little bit ahead of me. So the, the, the Force Awakens was the movie right before The Last Jedi, the one I just saw. Force Awakens ends with Rey, the new heroine that's trying to figure out how to use the Force and, and, and women's empowerment and she ra all kind of stuff, right? And so she is seeking a teacher. She's seeking out Luke Skywalker, as in the Luke Skywalker, as in Luke, I am the father, Luke Skywalker, okay? <laughs> and so Luke... It, it has gone away. She finds it in this really remote place. Like they, they, It was so remote and so hidden that it took two maps that they had to find to find out where Luke was. And the movie ends, The Force Awakens end, with Ray finding Luke. And let me tell you, that's kind of where the, the, this movie kind of starts. And what's interesting is that she finds Luke on an island. That's a very sacred place. It was the place of the first Jedi temple existed. And on that island, there's a tree. And inside that tree, guess what there is? It's a sacred Jedi texts that contain all the wisdom of the Jedi religion. And guess who's there protecting them? A sacred man, Luke Skywalker, who is there to make sure that the next generation of Jedi figures out how to use the wisdom in the appropriate and right way, whether it does or not, you have to watch the movie. But you understand, here it is, a sacred place with sacred text, with sacred men. It's not even a Christian thing. It's a force thing. <laughs> it's a Jedi thing, right? If we were to go and, and talk to, to Muslims, right, we would see that they have sacred places that they visit. Mecca, Medina, they have their mosques. They have sacred men, imams that control their sacred text that they follow. If we were able to go to some of the remote places in the jungle of the Amazon, to some of the remote regions of the desert of Africa, and we found some of the people that are still living in huts 
and very ancient religions, what we find is that there's a man there that they view as sacred, who controls sacred space. It doesn't even have to have walls, right? Some of you that have Native American background, you understand it could be a place that doesn't have to have walls and where, where they guard a sacred text and, and teach it to the other people that are following them. This is the model that is so everywhere. It's so ubiquitous in our world. And here's where we get into trouble. You ready? It sears itself into our consciousness. <clears throat> so that any time we seek to relate to God, we default to the temple model. We default to that model. Now, here's the thing, y'all. That's not what Jesus intended. That's not what Jesus wanted to do. Jesus comes on the scene and, and, and he doesn't reboot the temple model. He doesn't just redefine the temple model. Jesus starts something that is entirely brand new. And it was intention all from the beginning. But because this model is searing us, we've misunderstood. So, so there was a point in time when Jesus is hanging out with his disciples in a city called Caesarea Philippi. And they're hanging around talking, and Jesus looks at his disciples and he asks this question Who do people say that I am? Which I always thought was a weird question because, like, go home today and look at your family and go, who do people say that I am? This is weird, right? It's just a weird question. But nonetheless, the people responded and they said, Jesus, some people say that you're a prophet and some people say that you're Elijah, some say that you're John the Baptist. And then Jesus asked a really, really, really important question to the disciples. And it's a question he's asked of us too. It's a question we have to come to an answer to as well. And here it is. Jesus looks at us at the 12. She looks at the disciples and he said, who do you say that I am? Well, that's a much better question. That's a much more probing question. And as the disciples maybe are contemplating, or maybe Peter just jumps out with an answer, we, we aren't really told. But in Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 16, this is what Peter said. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. It's another word for Christ. You are the Christ the Son of the living God. And Peter, in this confession, lays out the bedrock, the basis of all our faith. Jesus is from God, the Son of God. He's the Messiah, the one that has been sent to save. All of that in one little sentence. And I don't know, I wasn't there, but I can imagine when Peter said that, Jesus might have smiled. Because he knows that what, G what Peter is saying is not something that he's taught him. It's not something that other people have taught him. It's something that God himself has given to him. Look what, look what he says. Jesus says this, and I tell you, excuse me, he said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. It, it, it. We've misunderstood this in a couple different ways. You see, when Jesus says, Peter, I'm going to build my church, some people have taken that to mean that the rock on which Jesus is going to build his church is the man, Peter. That's what our Catholic friends believe. And so Peter becomes the first pope, and now the pope becomes the first sacred man, and there's a succession of sacred men that have followed after him because we've misinterpreted the fact that Jesus was going to build his church on the rock of Peter. That, that's not what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, I'm going to build my church on this confession, this rock that you've made, this solid bedrock that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the foundation of the gospel. That is going to be the foundation of my church. The second thing, the second thing of misunderstanding is, is found in the word church. It's so, so frustrating sometimes because we've talked about this and we've talked about this and, and even I kind of find myself falling back into temple models sometimes. Because when Jesus says church here, he doesn't say it in English. He doesn't even use the word church. He uses a Greek word, ekklesia. It's actually a compound Greek word, ek, meaning out of. The word for to call, or kaleo is a Greek word, to call out. It literally means called out ones. You could translate it, the congregation, the gathering. See, what Jesus is getting at here is that, is that I'm not here to create a holy place where, where, with holy men where, where people go to get connected with God. I'm not rebooting the temple model. I'm doing something brand new. And here's what I'm doing. My church is going to be people who are called out by my name, whose faith is rooted not in a, a ritual, 
Not in style, not in a building, not in a man, but whose faith is rooted in the fact that I am Christ, Son of risen Lord. Jesus would come and go, it's not about sacred places and sacred men. Say, listen, this is what Jesus would do. He'd go, you know what? <clears throat> there are no more sacred places. How about that? Paul would take that and he would and he would he would put it into words in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, where he says, Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Let me, let me tell you what Paul is saying to us here. He says, Listen, there's no more sacred spaces. You're sacred. There's no more sacred places. You're sacred. There's no place you have to go to be connected to God. Because he has come and connected himself to you. He is living inside of you. Let me tell you the implications of that. This is, this is hard. I'm telling you, this is, this is going to push just a little bit. You will never be in a place more sacred than the person standing next to you. You are the temple of God. There's no more sacred place. You are sacred. You talk about sacred men, right? Sacred men to control everything. This is what Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, one of my favorite verses in the Holy New Testament. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. You're a priest. Let me tell you why it's a big deal. No more do you have to go to a man so that he can communicate to God on your behalf. No more do you have to go to a man so that he can intercede on your behalf or offer sacrifices on your behalf or pray to God on your behalf. That's, that, is, that is a way to pass. That is the temple model. That is not what Jesus came to accept. He came to accept something brand new. He would come and he would redefine the sacred texts. In his most famous sermon, in Matthew chapter 5, he would use this, this, this kind of uh, phraseology. He would say, you have heard, but I say. One of the ones that I, I like to point to uh, that's maybe the most challenging for us is Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. You have heard that it is said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with you in your heart. But what he's saying is, listen, <clears throat> your sin is something that matters to others. It matters to you. But your vertical relationship with God is taken care of through Jesus Christ. I'm going to redefine the sacred text. And Jesus doesn't come and say, I'm just going to create another sacred place with other sacred men who, who are going to guard sacred texts. Jesus comes in and he starts something brand spanking new. He takes the old covenant. He doesn't reinstitute it. He creates a new Covenant. There's going to be a new way that now you interact with God. It's not the old way. It's something brand new. When I was, when my kids were little, and then we used to read books to them. Now they read to themselves. Um, but one of the books that we read was The Hungry Caterpillar. Maybe you read it. The, the story's pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> it's about a caterpillar that's small. And he's hungry. And, and the caterpillar starts eating things, right? And the caterpillar eats, and the caterpillar eats, and the caterpillar eats. And about halfway through the book, we're told that the caterpillar is not a little caterpillar anymore. In fact, the phrase it uses is, now he is a great big fat caterpillar. And the caterpillar grows then and attaches itself to, a, to, a, to, a, to a, a stick, and it spins a cocoon around itself. Now, the scientific term is not described in the book, but what happens inside the cocoon is metamorphosis. And we're told that when the cocoon opens up, the caterpillar is no longer inside, but now the caterpillar is a beautiful butterfly. Not a great big fat caterpillar, not a skinny caterpillar, not a hungry caterpillar, but a butterfly. He's been transformed, he's been changed, and although he's related to what was in the past, he is no longer what he was in the past. He has been changed. Listen, I think one of the things that we misunderstand about the old and the new covenant is we think that one does that, that we have the old covenant, we hold on to, we got the new covenant, we hold on to, and somehow we make the new covenant fit into the old covenant. That's not what Jesus was doing. Jesus took the old covenant, and which was a cocoon that gave birth to the new covenant. Jesus has fulfilled the old covenant, and he has provided a new way for me to interact with God. No longer is it about sacred places and sacred men. Now it's about a God that has dwelt 
dwell with us and in us. It is about a direct relationship that we have with Him. That is not the temple model. And with this new covenant and with this new model, Jesus is going to do something absolutely revolutionary in that He is going to redefine the ethic by which we judge our relationship with God. That's a lot of, that's a lot of words. That's a real fact. He's going to redefine our ethic by which we define our relationship with God. Before, it was about these laws, these sacrifices. Jesus is going to do something else. On the last night that he was on this earth, before he was betrayed and crucified, Jesus was with his disciples. The twelve were there, and may have been some more. And they are in an, what we call an upper room. It's a room above another room. And <clears throat> Jesus would, would, would have the Passover meal with his disciples. And then he would do something that was so revolutionary. He would take off his outer garment, wrap a towel around his waist, and he would take a, a, a tub and he would wash the disciples' feet. He did for his disciples what they wouldn't even do for themselves. Nobody. He sits back down at the table after he was finished, and he says this, John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this will the world know that you are my disciples how many different sacred places you can get in one week. This is how the world is about disciples. How many sacred men you can listen to teach you sacred text. By this will the world know that you're my disciples. By the way that you love one another. Let me tell you how big this is. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, your vertical relationship with God is forever changed. He dealt with your sin problem once and for all. You are bearers of the righteousness of Christ. That is why Paul can say there is therefore now no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ. <coughs> right? Right? It's gone. He's taken care of that. But as long as we continue to live in the church temple model, excuse me, the temple model, what, what we do is we continue to define our ethic and worry about our ethic and worry about how we're going to screw up this relationship with God. That's taken care of. When God looks at you, he doesn't see a dirty, rotten sinner. He sees the righteousness of Christ. Praise God. Now what Jesus is going to say is this. The ethic by which you are going to define your relationship with God is by how you treat the people God cares about you. That's different, isn't it? Now all of a sudden, by loving my neighbor and loving my enemy and taking care of the people that God care about, now I am, I am in some way loving God in the same way. And the people are going to recognize that I'm a follower of God, not by how many sacred places I go to or sacred men I listen to, but by how well I love the other. That is brand new. That is paradigm shifting. You, you want to know something that's kind of cool? This was God's plan all along. 700 years before Jesus would be born, the prophet Isaiah, who's writing down God's words through him, would say this in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 19, see I am doing a new thing, right? Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Don't you see it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Like, like this was his plan all along. The old covenant would point out our need for God, but it would give birth to a God that came and even worked on our behalf. It was something that brand new. But if we're not careful, and y'all, I'm telling you, we haven't been careful as a church. If we aren't careful, the temple model will find its way back into our worship of God. And it will become about ritual. And it will become about places. And it will become about things. And it will stop being about God. Wait, wait, wait. Can we get uncomfortable for a minute? Because I'm already a little uncomfortable. Let's, let's, let's push into this. Do you want to know how it creeps back in to our worship? How it's so easy to fall back into the temple model? Does it bother you what people wear to church? Does it, does it bother you? I actually remember growing up in yeah, church, I love my home church. I'm not dogging out my home church, but, but I love them so much. But, but I can remember when I was a teenager, parents of some of the teenagers had a conversation about when it was appropriate to wear jeans in church. 
And the conclusion that they came to was it was okay to wear jeans on Sunday night church, but it wasn't okay to wear jeans on Sunday morning church. Temple model. It's a sacred place, right? Here's an interesting one. Does it bother you? Oh, this is tough. It's hard. Does it bother you when someone walks into our sanctuary, our sacred space, wearing a hat? That's temple model. That's not what Jesus defined. That's something that has to be let go. Listen, I know it makes me uncomfortable too. I get it. It's inside of me. It's so natural. It's, it's so natural to fall back into this. When I was a kid, do you, do you know I wasn't allowed to run in church. Why? Because it's a sacred place. Come on, come on. I have actually in meetings with deacons at previous churches that I've served at that are upset about people eating and drinking in our sanctuary, in our sacred place. They thought it was okay to eat or drink water and chew those up, but you couldn't drink now do, which really put me at odds with them. <laughs> <laughs> come on, is that uncomfortable? It's uncomfortable. It's great. Let me tell you why it's uncomfortable. It's because that's the temple model. That makes sense to us. Right? That makes sense to us. It, 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 it's not how we're wired to, to do that. It's, it's ingrained in who we are. How about this one? How about this one? Let's talk about sin for just a minute. When you sin, are you more concerned about what God's going to do to you because of your sin or about how your sin is going to affect your life and the life of people around you? Is one of those is temple model? And the other one is new ethic. Something that is brand Dude, I'm telling you, we could go on and on and on for days about how we elevate. Here's one that here's one that gets really close to home. Have you ever elevated a pastor to the point that they become such a sacred man that when they fall, it causes you to push away from their faith? That's temple. Because your faith should never be rooted in a sacred man. Your faith should never be rooted in a sacred place. Your faith is rooted in the rock that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the risen Lord. But we elevate us pastors, don't we? Oh, right? Come on. Jesus didn't come to reboot that temple model. For some of us, that's what we're living in. He came to do something brand new. So where does that lead? See, there are some of you here who are far from God. Maybe you show back up at church today because it's New Year. You promised man, mom you try to get back in church. Or maybe over New Year's, you met a pretty girl and you heard she'd be at church. And so, yeah, I don't know why you're here. I don't know why you're here. But, but you showed back up at church staff. I'm so glad you did. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to stop basing your faith in the temple model and start putting it in the God that changed the universe. I want you I don't want you to give church another chance. I want you to give Jesus another chance. I want you to recognize that it's bigger than any building and bigger than any man and bigger than anybody that controls whatever, whatever. It's about Jesus. And would you be willing just to give him another chance? In just a minute, we're going to do something that is really uncomfortable. I'm going to give you some silence. You know how much I hate silence. In that silence, it's actually what I want you to pray is I want you to pray, God, help me to lean back in you. God, help me, help me just to give you and, and, and see you and taste of your goodness. Not the old temple model, but something brand new. For some of you, the reason you haven't given your life to Jesus so far is because you think that following Jesus means a sacred place, a sacred man who guards a sacred, te- t- t- sacred text, and as a result, you see the power that comes from that and the money that comes from that, and it's just like a bad taste in your mouth. I'm not asking you to give church another chance. I'm asking you to give Jesus a chance. And if you're here today, when we stop to pray, you can pray right where you're at, but I want to encourage you, if that's you, and you want to give your life to Jesus, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to step out at the back of the room to our welcome center. One of our elders, a guy by the name of Jojo, the man so nice, I named him twice. Jojo. <laughs> He's going to be out there. Listen, listen. He would love to talk with you about that. Right? After the service, maybe you don't want to go find Jojo because he's got two names, and that's weird. But, but if you don't want to talk to Jojo, I'll be around. I'll stay as long as I have to. I'll stay and I'll talk. Form a line. It's okay. We'll, just, we'll sit and we'll talk about this, and we'll do when the service is over. Call me this week. Send me an email. I want to talk to you about this because, listen, 
What you've pushed back from in church is not what the church was meant to be. And it's, it's our fault. It's my, I'm willing to own it, right? But that's not what God intended to be. Would you be willing to step not into a religion, but in a relationship? But for the majority of us in here, we're already followers of Jesus. Today, would you be willing, as we give you some silence, just to pray? You can come and you can pray up here at these stairs. It doesn't matter. There's no sacred spot up here or anything, right? You can pray at your seat. You can go in one of the rooms behind. You can go find somebody to pray with. It doesn't matter. But would you ask this question? God, what am I holding on to that's holding me back? What am I holding on to that I'm not going to let go of? What am I holding on to that's a temple mom? Jesus is coming to do something brand new. And over the next few weeks, we're going to flesh that out. We're going to talk about what Peter had to say about it, what Paul had to say about it, what Jesus had to say about it. And we're going to point you to Bible text after Bible text after Bible text that leads you to discover these things and root them out so your relationship is not defined by sacred places and sacred men that control sacred texts. It's defined by a relationship with the living. God, I'm going to start as praying, and then I'm going to give you some silence, and then I'll close this. God, I thank you so much for the opportunity you've given us to be here today. God, I, I know that it's so easy for us to fall back into the same old practices of the temple model. God, that model served a purpose for a time, but, but it's given birth now to something brand new. For those that are far from you, God, I pray that they would start leaning into your goodness. Not because the church gets it right, but because you did it right. God, for those that are, that are maybe lost and maybe are, are seeking for something, God, I pray that in this moment that's ahead, you would cause them to, to have the, the unction to move, to go find JoJo, to come find me, so that we might be able to talk to them about what it means to have a relationship versus a religion. God, I pray that you would Move in those of us that are here that are followers of you but are holding on to something. God, it may be the thing that we need to let go of that sends us to the next level with you so that we experience true freedom in Christ, so that we experience the gospel. So God, as we stop and pray as a congregation, I pray that you hear prayers. I just want you to forgive me the times that I've fallen back into the temple. Forgive me for even inadvertently creating systems that lead people to that. You've been so gracious to us and so good to us to provide a way where there was no way to do something brand new that, that would change our lives and change the world again. God, right now there are people in this room that are wrestling and struggling. Maybe they're hurt a little bit. Maybe they're angry a little bit. God, I don't know. You help them to realize that you're calling them to yourself. You're calling them to a relationship. Buildings, they're important, right? Programming, that's important. Budgets, that's important. Those things are tools that are used to reach people for you. But God, ultimately, you didn't call us to those things. And should all of those things go away? 
you remain. Help us to see the areas that we lack. Help us to see the areas where we're holding on to something we should let go of. And then help us to do exactly what we do. Love you. Trust you. Praise you.